First United Methodist Church here in downtown Erie. I'm Pastor Jim Parkinson. In addition to all these wonderful uh, smiling people we have here in person, I know there's also some people joining us on Facebook Live. If that's you, the only way we have to know that you're there is if you'd be so kind as to go and sign in in the comment field. Um, and uh, for everybody else, okay, we're really glad you're here today. Okay, let's, uh, so we've got a bunch of announcements today. First up, Bob's working on the echo back there. He's having fun. Um, okay, first up, we are continuing to do various fundraisers to help raise money to send kids to Wesley Woods Church Camp this summer. Yes, all of the churches here, all the Methodist churches here in Erie coordinate ourselves together on this. We send uh, mostly inner city kids. Um, so the latest fundraiser we have to announce is uh, you can buy a coupon for a dozen cookies from Ars Bakery. That's out there on West Lake Road. Uh, they cost $5. $2 goes towards campership. Um, you can get it either by seeing my wife. She's in the back. She's waving her hand back there. So you can see her. Or you can talk to uh, Valerie in the church office. You have to order these by March 28th to get your coupon. You can take the coupon to Ars Bakery at any time to redeem it. Uh, they never expire. Uh, and you're free to choose from all the different flavors of cookies they have. Obviously, the flavors they have at the time you go is what you can choose from. Um, so again, uh, this is to raise funds to help send inner city kids to church camp this summer. Um, next up, uh, a reminder, Easter is coming. It will be the first Sunday in April. Um, therefore, you have to order your Easter flowers by next Sunday. That's when the, the uh, florist tells us we have to have the orders in by. So. Uh, come in by next Sunday. Uh, you can order in honor or memory of a loved one. Uh, the forms are inside your bulletin, and uh, you turn those into the church office. Um, also, Holy Week. Um, again, the Methodist Connection has two services planned on Monday, Thursday. The first service will be at Glenwood United Methodist Church down there at uh, Myrtle and Peach. Um, that's at noon. Uh, the second service will be out at Asbury United Methodist Church, which is out there on Westwood, Westwood Road, just this side of Walmart. Um, both of those services are available in person. There's also online options. There's also some other services that the Connection's doing that will be uh, strictly online. We'll be providing more information about those as we get closer to Easter. <laughs> then again, for Easter Sunday, um, the reality is we already have two services on Easter Sunday. I'm not anticipating space problems in the early service. There will be space problems in this service. The only way we can deal with this is, uh, is we're going to have to require reservations just like we did on Christmas Eve. You make your reservations by talking to Valerie in the church office. Uh, just tell her how many people you have. Our capacity is about 90 people. And... Uh, um, so as I said, call the church office. I recommend doing it sooner rather than later. Of course, uh, all of those services are also available online, uh, but we are gonna have limits on how many people we can have in person. Last one is spring is coming, and next Sunday is when the time changes. Of course, we're now in the spring, so that means you have to show up an hour earlier. So please don't forget that next uh, Saturday night to move your clocks ahead because it's spring and we spring forward. Okay, let's prepare to worship the Lord our God today. As Brittany brings the light of Christ here into our sanctuary and it flows on into our hearts. By the way, this is Brittany's uh, uh, premiere back for her first time after the pandemic began because she's fully vaccinated now. So we're glad to have Brittany back with us able to accolade.
Blessings to all of us who are able to be present this morning in worship and those who join us uh, on the internet and also live this evening on WERG 90.5 FM. I want to thank Bruce, especially for that marvelous prelude that he just shared with us. What a great way to start worship. I invite us all now to stand as we join in our spoken call to worship. The road to the cross may be steep. We may lose our way. The path may be rocky. There are twists and turns. There is danger and risk. There will be an ending. Walk on, trusting as you go. Amen. Our opening hymn is Lead On, O King Eternal. We will be singing all three verses. invite all of us to join together in the opening prayer. You'll find it in your bulletin and also on the screen. Let us pray. Gracious God, the journey is long and the cross is heavy. We come today to this place of worship tired, tired of responsibility, tired of turning the other cheek, tired of returning good for evil, and tired of serving you unnoticed. 
We wish someone else could bear our burdens for us. We long for an oasis in our wilderness. In the quietness of these moments, help us to turn our eyes upon one who has taken responsibility, who has turned the other cheek, who has returned good for evil, who has borne our burdens for us. Enable us to enjoy our lightened load, to continue our Lenten journey, to find the oasis of your love, and to drink the waters of mercy and compassion. Amen. All right, I know there's some children with us today. Unfortunately, in the early service today, as I was putting communion on the uh, altar, I proceeded to misstep, fell, and twisted my ankle, and it definitely hurts. I do not recommend that. Come on, guys. Hi, Clara. Who do you got with you today, Clara? Who's this? You got a name? Does your little doggy have a name? Hi, Jane. Morning, guys. Okay, I brought a couple things with me. Who can tell me what these are? Crosses. Are they the same? They're different. How do you know they're crosses? Because they make it, they look kind of like a T. Yes, a cross always looks like a T. So there's a cross like the one we have up there on the altar. See, that's what's up on the screen. So there's a lot of different ways that crosses can look. Matter of fact, I got this next one. It shows you all kinds of them. I don't even know the names of all of these. Uh, I know one of those over there is actually a cross from Ireland. And I know the one on the bottom is called the cross that budded, you know, because something that was dead comes back to life. There's all kinds of them. But there's one more that I wanted to talk about specifically. Go ahead by one more. This is called the Orthodox cross. How many bars go across that cross? Green. Okay, now we know what the middle bars were, right? That's for holding Jesus' arms and hands. Does anybody know what the top one's all about? What's on the top one? Okay, can any big people help us? What's on the top little one up there? It says, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. That was the, the thing that declared who he was. What about the one on the bottom? What's that for? Any idea what that's for? Okay, on crosses, they would put little things along the bottom of the feet so you could support yourself just a little bit. We really mean they did that so it would take you longer to die. And it's bent because they're saying that as Jesus was dying, he pushed on it. Right? So that's what an orthodox cross is. Right? But it really doesn't matter what the cross looks like. It all means the same thing. So this is a verse from our Bible lesson today. Everybody's going to help us read this out loud together. Go ahead, Elliot. Here we go. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are headed for destruction. But we who are being saved know it is the very power of God. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for the sign of the cross. Although it was a place of death for us, it has become an emblem of life. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys. You can sit down.
Please be so kind as to take the friendship pads that you find along the center end out of your row. As you uh, pass it through your row, if you happen to be with us for the first time today, there's this card that's clipped in the front cover. You can take it, fill it out, tell us a little bit about you. Either leave it there in the pad or you can drop it in the offering plate in a moment. You'll also find this little brochure clipped in the front cover. You're free to take it. It tells you a little bit about us. Then we asked that everyone record their presence with us today. All right, uh, that also means that those of you who are at home, if you haven't already done so and you have access to that comment field, please go there and also record your presence with us. And of course, the way the offering works today uh, is uh, during the offertory, you may bring your offering either to the plate here in the center of the front or the center of the back. And, uh, and of course, those of you who are at home can mail it on into the church office. So it is with joy and thanksgiving in our hearts that we give our tithes and offerings to God today.
Let's pray. God of all, we see, you see, all we don't see. As we offer these gifts to you, we're reminded how easy it is for us to make our money and possessions into false gods, to worship them and see them as the source of our contentment and security. Open our eyes to see our foolishness. Strengthen our resolve to be faithful and obedient to your commandments. Fill our hearts with a reminder of your gift of grace, which bears us up when we fall. With grateful hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Our prayer hymn today is Beneath the Cross of Jesus. Uh, we'll be singing all three verses. The words are on the screen. Again, beneath the cross of Jesus. <laughs> Center us in the journey to the cross. At the sights and sounds of Christ's journey towards Jerusalem, may we remember that we too must find our way to a new understanding of sacrifice for the sake of the love of others. Lead us not into the temptation of excuses or definitions that keep us distant from your purpose. 
May we come to know the quiet joy of love burning deep within us that calls forth a desire to give ourselves for your world as Christ did. Forgive us our distractions. Heal our wounds. Give us courage for this journey, not only to the cross, but also beyond to your new life for all peoples. May it be so. Now, O oh Holy God, we lift up to you these joys and concerns from among your people here at your church. We come today, Lord, to George Thomas asking prayer for his brother-in-law, whose mother, Ruth, died back in January. We know, Lord, that we can be overwhelmed by grief, and we pray that you'll bring comfort uh, into his life. Also lift up uh, Chipper Clausen today. He'll be heading out on Friday to have a procedure on his esophagus at the surgery center. We continue to lift up uh, Joe and Ann Bolash's grandson, Jess. We know he's now back at home with his mother. Also come today, Lord, lifting up Pauline Ramos. She had had a fall a little over a week ago, broke her hip, was in St. Vincent Hospital. But long before her fall, she had uh, breathing difficulties, and those difficulties put her in ICU for a few days. She's now back to a regular room and hoping to be able to transition over to Sarah Reed soon. Also come today, Lord, praying for Kathy Kinsel. She continues to be at the Western Reserve. Of course, she was suffering from COVID and now has been released and has returned to her regular room. But of course, her real reason for being there is she's recovering from foot surgery. We also come today, Lord, praying for Flo Sturgis's daughter, Carol. Carol's going to be having cancer surgery soon. We also come praying for a, a, a gentleman who was with us last week. His name is Kevin Cullen. Uh, they have discovered a mass in his lungs. We pray, Lord, that your healing hand is going to be upon him. Then we come today, Lord, with heavy hearts, because Shamim's grandmother, Bibi, has died. We pray for comfort for Shamim and for her mother and the rest of the family as they go through this time of mourning. And then, Lord, as we do each week, we pray for some of the children that we minister to. This week, it's for three of our city youth. We pray for Gershom, for Rihanna, and for Prete. Holy God, thank you for listening for our prayers, for caring for those for whom we've prayed. Lead us forward through this season of Lent to a deeper understanding of your suffering and death. Draw us closer to the cross as we join our voices together, as we pray that prayer that your son Jesus taught us to pray, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Before we move on to our Bible lesson, just a couple of updates on a few things. Many of you know it's been just over two weeks since my brother-in-law died of COVID. Fortunately, my sister Joyce has recovered and is doing well. Uh, but then it starts spreading through other of the family there in Florida. And uh, at the moment, my nephew uh, James has COVID. His wife has just recovered. And their oldest daughter also has COVID. So we uh, certainly would ask prayers for them. And then, of course, uh, it's also been just over two weeks since Ron Calicchio went on to glory. And as everybody knows, Ron was a very faithful member of this church. Uh, Pre-COVID, he was sitting back there about where Luis is sitting right now. Uh, Post-COVID, he was always over here in the corner. Anyhow, uh, we have a special guest with us today. Uh, Ron's brother, Don, is back there. Don, you can wave so people can see who you are back there. Um, make sure after the service that you greet Don as well. Of course, we've prayed for Don many times. All right, our Bible lesson today is from Paul's uh, first letter to the believers there at Corinth. I'm going to be reading from Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, uh, verses 18 through 25. The words are up on the screen, and I invite you to listen to God's word. 
for the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand a sign and Greeks desire wisdom. But we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please bow with me in prayer. Everlasting Father. In this season of Lent, we confess our sinfulness and remember the suffering of you, that your Son endured for us. Reveal to us today your holy word. Amen. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a crown as Jesus was making his way towards Jerusalem to meet his destiny on a hill called Calvary, no one was thinking anything about a cross. What people saw was a man who healed the sick, who cured leopards, who made the lame to walk and the blind to see. What they saw was a man who was a miracle worker extraordinaire. He could turn water into wine. He could feed the multitudes with five barley loaves and two small fish. He could walk on water. He could calm the seas. This man was the long-awaited Messiah, the anointed one from the tribe of Judah, who spoke with the authority of the prophets of old. In just a couple of weeks, the crowds would welcome Jesus into Jerusalem with shouts of Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Yes, no one was thinking anything about a cross. No one, that is, but Jesus. All too soon, on a hill drawing near, a freshly cut cross would stand to inflict immeasurable suffering and unspeakable shame. No one cherished the cross, that dreaded cross, that terrifying instrument of torment, Only God could turn an emblem of death into a sign of life. That emblem of suffering and shame has become, for us who believe, a cherry symbol of forgiveness, salvation, and life. That's why we adorn our places of worship with a cross. We have a cross here on the altar table because it reminds us of Christ's sacrifice for our sins. We have a cross uh, front and center to remind us of the message of the cross and its everlasting rule for our lives. We have crosses atop the steeple of churches 
Because it is Christ's sacrifice on that cross that pardons our sin and lifts us heavenward into the very presence of the Lord God Almighty. We cherish the cross because the one who died on the cross died for us. And the one who rose from the cross lives for us, making us one with God and one with each other and one in ministry to all the world. The emblem of death is now truly a sign of life. Our Bible lesson today is a masterful piece of prose. It is simultaneously whimsical while also being magnificently profound. These are not the words of a mere mortal. These words don't rely on the accumulated wisdom of the ages. These words aren't the logical outcome of deep human thought. These words aren't the culmination of very intense study of the world and its creatures. These words are inspired by the Spirit of God, and they reveal the mysterious means by which God is making it possible for us to turn around and face God. The Apostle Paul quotes the Old Testament prophet Isaiah, there in 1 Corinthians 1, the end of verse 19. I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. This isn't the kind of message for us to dissect and analyze and scrutinize deep within that gray matter of our minds. This is the kind of message that you marvel over and enjoy and cherish within the inner recesses of your souls. After all, for the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. So what exactly is the message of the cross that Paul's writing about? What story does the cross jog in our memories? Well, I'm going to give all of you an opportunity, at least some of you an opportunity to answer that. Valerie has the microphone back there. Stand up, Valerie. She's got the microphone. So uh, I'm going to give probably two or three of you a chance to answer this question. Now, remember, I'm not looking for deep intellectual answers. I'm just looking for the kind of answer that springs out of the joy of your heart. So in your own words, what is the message of the cross? What's the cross speak about? What does the cross mean in your life? How does the cross encourage your faith? Okay, anybody who wants to answer, raise your hand. I'm sure there's somebody who will give this a try. Who wants to answer? What is the message of the cross? Chuck will answer up here. Come on up, Valerie. Valerie, up here. And you'll have to hand it in. He's right up here. Come on, Valerie. He's right here. Here's, here's Ed. I'm sorry. Here's Chuck. He's coming around to get to you, Chuck. Fly on around here, Valerie, and catch him in the middle of it all. Chuck, she's bringing the microphone right to you, right here. Got to use the microphone or the people at home won't never hear you. Go ahead, Chuck. What's the cross mean? Jesus died for our sin. Okay. He shed his blood at the cross. There we go. We have to pick, we have to trust in him, for there's no other way but to believe in Jesus Christ. We all have to get down on our knees and accept Jesus as our personal Savior and pick up his word and read it daily. Thank you, Chuck. All right, so the cross represents forgiveness of sins. Anybody else? What's the message of the cross? Who else wants to give it a try? Everybody's intimidated now because Chuck was so eloquent. What's the message of the cross? Who else wants to give it a try? Up here, yes, Karen. It's uh, the message is Jesus' love for us. That he yes. would die for us. Our and the cross, the cross is a sign of Jesus' love for us. We'll give one more person a chance. Over here, Linda Ellsworth over on the far end. We're going to see how fast Val can be now. She has her running shoes on. Yeah. 
Linda, what does the what's the message of the cross? Jesus died for us, and then he rose three days later, so that we know that there is life after that. Now the message of the cross is life, okay, everlasting life. Valerie, you did fantastic. Everybody, give Valerie some applause. She's a wonderful microphone girl. Okay, and you can go back to your seat, Val. Thank you. Clearly, the cross means a lot to us. That's why it is that we adorn our places of worship with crosses. That's why we wear cross pendants around our neck. That's why the early Christians divine, you know, that hand gesture, okay, uh, signifying their devotion to God. Everybody recognizes that hand gesture, right? It's the sign of the cross. Uh, years ago, I can remember, just back when I was in Union City, we had a scout Sunday one Sunday, and uh, there were, were uh, boys in the Boy Scout troop from churches all over town. And uh, some of the younger scouts in particular, they had come from the Catholic church there in the town. Go ahead by one, Elliot. Um, so during the service, uh, there was a time when one of the younger scouts actually came up, walked up towards the altar, and proceeded to cross himself. I looked around. There were all kinds of people just smiling because, after all, he, he was just a young guy, and he didn't know that in Protestant churches we don't do that. I can remember after the service, one of the uh, Catholic adults, you know, they, they came up to me and they apologized. But the truth of the matter is no apology is necessary. Now, we're in a place of worship, and the sign of the cross has always been central to our worship. After all, it is in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit that we worship today. Yes, our God, only our God, could turn an emblem of death into a glorious sign of life. Yet to the majority of the world, the cross remains a stumbling block. They get all crossed up. They can't get past the cruel and unusual suffering the cross inflicts. They can't get past the inhumane torture and the embarrassment and shame of the cross, not only for the one being executed, but the shame on the society that would endure such a gruesome means of execution. They also can't fathom how the unjust suffering and death of an innocent man could possibly ever bring glory to God. This bothered Jews and Gentiles alike back in the first century, it continues to bother Jews and Gentiles alike today. Surely, there must be some way to have a religion founded on love and peace without having to base it on an unjustly cruel cross. So, the cross is an embarrassment. The cross is a logical inconsistency. The cross is all just so much foolishness. Besides, how could God be so weak as to die at the hands of mere mortal human beings? The message of the cross remains a stumbling block to most of the world's peoples today. Back in 2012, Jefferson Biskey, at that time he was a 22-year-old fellow from Tacoma, Washington. He now lives with his wife and kids out in Hawaii. He sprung into the public eye uh, when a video he posted on YouTube went viral overnight. Okay. Normally, the kinds of videos that go viral on, on YouTube are of silly things. Like that one of the Japanese girl who conducted an experiment of what would happen when you put Mentos into a bottle of Coke. Hundreds of millions of people watched that video to find out. By the way, network television only dreams of ever having that many viewers. But Jefferson Bithke's video wasn't about some silly inane experiment. Bithke titled his video, Why I Hate Religion, but love Jesus. I'm curious, anybody here ever seen that video? By the way, everybody in the early service saw it. Virtually none of you have seen it. You're leading to pride lies. By the way, all you got to do, go to YouTube, look for why I hate religion. I guarantee you it will be the first thing to pop up. Not only has Bithke's video had tens of millions of views, it's also received dozens of video responses. One of the most watched video responses is by a, the Muslim response by Camille Sully. Now, in his video, video Sully contrasts uh, each of Bithke's points with the, Methodist, uh, with the Muslim understanding of those points. Okay, now obviously, I'm not going to agree with Camille, 
But I do have to give him credit for stating the Muslim understanding so clearly. I want you to listen to just a little clip of Kamal's uh, response. Let's listen. You say Jesus was God and that God had descended. We say Jesus was man, but Jesus was dependent. Our God is all great and cannot be comprehended. You say that God was murdered or do you believe that he pretended? See, God gave us brains and God gave us logic, but I guess God wanted us to use them in everything else except for this topic. It's like wearing a cross and proclaiming that you love Jesus when if God was murdered on the cross, the cross really shouldn't please us. I mean, would you be wearing an axe if it was used to chop your mother up into pieces? I hope, as you listen to Kamal's response, that you weren't reacting to how it is he's dressed or the fact that I told you that he's a Muslim. I hope that you would react simply to his words. Everything he says is perfectly reasonable. He's being completely logical. The cross was used to persecute Jesus. So why would anyone who loved Jesus, including Kamal, celebrate that? To Kamal, the message of the cross is just so much foolishness. And by the way, he's not just some radical fundamentalist. There are hundreds of millions of people in the world today who believe exactly as Kamal does. To them, the message of the cross is utter foolishness. We see wisdom in God's foolishness and power in God's weakness. Yet to the majority of the world, the cross does remain a stumbling block. So preach Christ crucified because it's God's power to save all who believe. All of us who believe that Jesus actually died on the cross in our place, but more than that, that God raised him from the dead, so we believe in God's foolishness, and we believe that that foolishness is infinitely wiser than human wisdom. We believe in the cross, not because we're smarter or more spiritual than others. We believe because God has offered to help us in our unbelief, and we've responded to God's offer. If there's anything I've learned from a lifetime of being a follower of Christ, is that you can't shove religion down anyone's throat. I am never going to win anyone to Christ by my, the pervas persuasiveness of my arguments. Logic can lead you to the door of faith, but at some point you have to take Kierkegaard's proverbial leap of faith. You have to stop leaning on your own understanding and start leaning on God. So the best way any of us can hope is through God's grace. Others might, that somehow through God's grace, others might catch a glimpse of God's love for us and therefore take that same leap of faith and accept God's offer of help and find their place in God's kingdom too. I can tell you, like so many other pastors, I struggle to find ways to say things that doesn't rely solely on churchy words. By the way, that's really hard for me. I've spent my entire life in the church. We need to always be on the lookout for new and fresh ways to present the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're to be people who truly love Jesus and to love to tell the story of Jesus. I, I ran across a story. By the way, this story isn't new. But it was new to me. I suspect it's going to be new to most of you, too. Now, anyone who is my age or older knows who Charles uh, Chuck Colson was. He was the special counsel to President Richard Nixon, who ended up spending time in federal prison because of his role in the infamous Watergate scandal. After his relief from prison, Colson founded Prison Fellowship, which deals with the injustices in the prison system. In his later years, before he died in 2012, Colson had visited prisons all around the world. I want you to, I want to close today with a story from one of Colson's prison visits. Once he went to visit a prison in Brazil, 
And Colson there came across a wonderful example of the power of the cross. The warden at the prison assigned a prisoner who had been a convicted murderer to take uh, Colson on a tour of the prison. Uh, Colson was pleased to see that the prison was neat and clean and the prisoners were all hard at work and smiling. Finally, his tour guide offered to show Colson the notorious isolation block where uncooperative prisoners at one time were tortured. His guide told Colson that today the isolation unit housed only a single prisoner. As they arrived at the unit's massive door, his guide asked Colson if he were afraid to go inside. Well, Colson replied, of course not. I I've been in isolation cells all over the world. Slowly, the guide swung open the door. Colson looked inside to see that the lone prisoner there in the cell was a crucifix that had been beautifully hand-carved by the inmates. The guide then grinned and smiled. In, an, in, in a reverent whisper, he said, he's doing time for the rest of us. That's the mystery of the cross. Christ did our time to set us free. So let's continue to preach Christ crucified because it remains God's power to save all who believe. As Jesus was making his way towards Jerusalem to meet his destiny on that hill called Calvary, no one was thinking anything about a cross. Back then, no one cherished that dreaded cross that terrifying instrument of torment and pain. Yes, only our God could turn an emblem of death into a glorious sign of life. The emblem of suffering and shame has become for us who believe a cherished symbol of forgiveness, salvation, and life. Yet to the majority of the world, the cross does remain a stumbling block. The cross was used to persecute Jesus, so why would anyone who loves Jesus, including Kamal, celebrate that? But there is wisdom in God's foolishness and power in God's weakness. So let's continue to preach Christ crucified because it remains God's power to save all who believe. The mystery of the cross is that Christ has served our time and has set us free. Don't get all crossed up. Believe. Lift high the cross. The love of Christ proclaim. Now all the world adores his sacred name. Let's pray. Almighty God, thank you for coming in the person of your son Jesus, who died our death and rose for our sake, to provide a place for us in your kingdom, a place for all who believe. Today, as we come to the Lord's table, I remind you that in the United Methodist Church, you do not have to be a member of this church to be welcome at God's table. There are three things that you do need, however. First of all, you need to earnestly repent of your sins. That means that you need to turn away from those things in your life that are separating you from God and turn back towards God. You also need to have love for God and your neighbor in your heart. Now, I know that that's not always easy because some of our neighbors are harder to love than others, but through the power of God's Spirit working within us, we can do that. And then lastly, you need the desire to walk in the ways of Jesus. If that describes you today, then you are welcome at the Lord's table. Let's all join together as we confess our sins. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbor. And we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
Here's the good news. Christ died for us. While we were yet sinners, that proves God's love towards us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God in the highest. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and a joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. In love, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, your love remained steadfast. You bid your faithful people cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy the Easter feast that renewed by your word and sacrament and fervent in prayer and works of justice and mercy, we may come from the full, to the fullness of grace that you have prepared for those you love. And so, with your people on earth and all of the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ, whom but you sent in the fullness of time to redeem the world. He emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in our likeness. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. He took upon himself our sin and death and offered himself a perfect sacrifice for the sin of the whole world. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. Our Lord, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. After he had given thanks to his disciples, to his father, he broke that bread. He gave it to his disciples. He said, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Eat this and remember me. And after they'd eaten, in like manner, he took the cup. Again, when he'd given thanks to his father, he gave it to his disciples. He said, take and drink. This is my blood of the new covenant shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it and remember me. And so it is in remembrance of these, your mighty acts, in Jesus Christ, that we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the whole world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, Make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly night. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with your Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. As those who are going to assist with communion come forward, I remind you that we see this as a means of grace. This is a means of even prevenient grace. That's that grace that God offers to people even in the process of salvation. So because of that, we welcome even little children at the table. So the way this will work is as you come forward, as you come forward, you'll come by way of the center aisle. Um, and um, let's see, Loretta will have the bread. No, I'm sorry, Loretta will have the cup. So Loretta, you're going to stand to that side. Keith is going to have the bread. Keith will stand to this side. So what you'll do, and, uh, and Jim there is going to help dismiss people uh, you know, half a row at a time. So you come forward, um, you go first to Keith. Uh, he will break off a piece of bread and give it to you. You then stand, face the altar. You can move your mask long enough to eat it. You then turn and face Loretta, and, and she will hand you a cup. Again, you can turn towards the altar, 
Um, you remove your la mask long enough to drink it, put your mask back on, you can put the empty cups, there's little containers on either side, and return to your seats by way of the outside aisle. We know we always have a few people who are not physically able to come forward. So for those of you who can't, Donna and I will come to you. All you need to do is when you see us near, you know, make sure you wave your hand so we know that that's you. So we invite all of you to come and partake of this sacrament to the comfort of your soul.
The scripture says that after the meal, they sang a hymn and went out. Our closing hymn today is Jesus, Keep Me Near the Cross. We'll be singing all four verses. The words are up on the screen again. Jesus, keep me near the cross. Let's stand as we sing. Get all crossed up. 
May the cross of Christ be for you the power of God. Go forth and preach Christ crucified so that all the world may have life. God's people said, Amen. Amen.